Hey, welcome back to AP Chemistry. You're here with Mrs. Mays, and today we're working on calculations of the lattice energy in ions and ionic bonding. So let's get started because this process is going to be calculator intensive. Get ready. So first of all, let's look at ions. Basically, we know that atoms tend to react in such a way that they would form the noble gas configuration, right? So that means that a metal would tend to lose electrons so that it can form cations. Nonmetals can share electrons in covalent bonds with one another, or they could um, gain electrons from metals to form anions. And then uh, positive and negative charges would attract. When we talk about ionic compounds, we're talking about the solid crystal that is formed when a positive and negative charge um, ions align themselves in such a way that it maximizes the attractions between opposite charges and minimizes any repulsions between like ions. So the crystal lattice sets itself up in a geometry that makes this the most stable um, configuration possible. They react so that each type of atom can achieve the noble gas configuration that it wants to have, um, but then the crystal lines itself up to minimize repulsions and maximize attractions. We also learned in our last unit that ion size tends to increase as you go down in a group on the periodic table. So from, say, lithium to francium, that ion size increases because we are going to um, add more shielding and more electron shells as you go from the um, top ener from energy level one um, all the way up to larger atoms with energy level four, five, six, right? Um, cations are going to be smaller, though, than the atoms that they are formed from because when they lose electrons, they get rid of that outside valence shell and drop down into a smaller orbital than what they were in before. Anions, though, are larger because they gain the electrons without adding any more protons to hold on to them. So across a row, ions are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until suddenly they get larger. The first half of that row are going to be the cations, the ones that are losing electrons. And then the second half is where we start gaining electrons again. Once we hit that plus or minus four section, then we would be forming the anions. And that's why we see this crazy trend of the ions getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're bigger. Well, that's because we start gaining electrons instead. So let's look at this periodic trend. Across the period, the nuclear charge is going to get bigger. And as the nuclear charge gets bigger, the ions, cations, gets smaller. The energy level changes between anions and cations, so that's what makes the anions larger. A cation loses the electrons and goes back to a lower energy level. So check it out. Here we have one period that shows the lithium ion, beryllium, boron, and carbon. These cations are um, getting smaller and smaller, and look at that tiny little ion for carbon, because they've all lost enough electrons to get back to the noble gas configuration of helium atoms. But then, as you look at the next level of ions, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, they're still in energy level two, but they're trying to get to the noble gas configuration of neon by adding enough electrons to complete that um, subshell, the um, 2, 2p6 subshell, so they can have the configuration of neon. That's why these are larger, because they're filling in a different energy level than the cations do. So let's just do a bit of review real quick, see if you can remember how atomic radius goes. Now these are not ions, these are atoms. So let's put the following atoms in order by increasing atomic radius. We've got, what do we have? Germanium, silicon, selenium, 
and chlorine. So the first thing I'm going to look at is the row that these atoms are in. If this is energy level 3 and this is energy level 4, then I automatically know that germanium and selenium are bigger because they have more electrons shielding the valence electrons from the nucleus. And in energy level 3, those will automatically be smaller as atoms, not necessarily as ions, but certainly as atoms. Okay, what's next? Now I know germanium and selenium are the biggest, but which one comes first? Look at the atomic number. Germanium has 32 positive charges, 32 protons, and selenium has 34 positive charges. That means germanium has a nucleus with a lower nuclear charge. It cannot pull the electrons in quite as closely, so it will be bigger than selenium. The same would be true for silicon and chlorine, where there's only 14 protons that pulls less than 17 protons, so chlorine is my smallest and germanium is my biggest, and I believe that matches none of my choices. What germanium, then selenium, then silicon, and then chlorine. Doesn't that make sense? Makes sense to me. Yeah? Okay. Do you see this choice? Did I miss it? No, I don't see it anywhere. So we made our own choice. That works too. Let's look at the size of isoelectronic ions, which means they have the same number of electrons and they may or may not have the same number of protons, right? Aluminum has 13 protons because on the periodic table its atomic number is 13. Magnesium has 12 protons, sodium is number 11, neon is 10, fluorine is 9, oxygen is 8, and then nitrogen is 7. So we know how many protons they have based on their atomic number but they all have the same number of electrons. Let's look at the configuration for neon. It goes like this, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. It fills in all of those, right? Now look what aluminum does. It starts out with 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then regular old aluminum also has the 3s2 and 3p1. But in order for us to form the aluminum ion, we have to lose these three electrons from the valence shell, right? Those three go away, and now look what configuration it has. The same as neon. That's what we mean by isoelectronic. So all of the ions in this list have 10 electrons just like neon. The reason they have 10 electrons is so that they can get that noble gas configuration. All of them have 10 electrons, and they all have the same electron configuration but they do not all have the same number of protons. What we know is that the cations, the positively charged ions, that is, have more protons, so they're going to be smaller. Here's a picture of the atomic radii. Aluminum is certainly the smallest. Nitrogen, having only seven protons, is going to be the largest ions of these. In forming ionic compounds, we have to take into consideration the amount of energy that is associated with creating solid ionic compounds or crystals from its gaseous ions. We call this the lattice energy. And we calculate it by an indirect route. We can't really measure a metal gas plus a non-metal gas ions making a compound. We have to sort of go about it in a roundabout sort of way. Um, the energy, though, that's released, the lattice energy, is the energy that is paying for the cost of making ionic compounds. Since energy is a state function, then we can get it from the reactions that it takes to go from our reactants to the products in a roundabout way, in a series of steps, shall we say. So let's look at the steps for lithium fluoride. Um, our beginning point is to start with solid lithium and gaseous fluorine because that's the way those elements would typically be found 
in nature. And then we have to turn the solid lithium into a gas. And then we have to turn the gaseous lithium into ions of uh, lithium plus. And what would come next? So now we have one ion, let's form the other. We're going to first split the fluorine molecule so that we have free fluorine atoms and then we must ionize those atoms, turn them from atoms into ions. And since that stabilizes the atom, gets it to a noble gas configuration, then the energy dropped. Now it's more stable. And then the biggest gain is right here where we put the two ions together and now everything's more stable. Remember opposites attract, right? And so we have an overall change that's described as the lattice energy for that molecule, I'm sorry, for that ionic compound so that we can um, calculate, this is called the lattice energy, but we had all these steps to go through so that we could get there. So let's try it ourselves. Let's do some math. Oops, drawing dots. So going through this process, going through this series of steps is called the Born-Haber cycle for calculating lattice energy. We'll start with solid sodium and um, fluorine molecules. First we have to turn sodium from a solid to a gas. That's called sublimation, going from solid to gas. And that energy will cost us 109 kilojoules per mole. Next, we have to ionize the sodium atoms, turn them into ions by removing an electron. And that also is going to cost us some energy, 495 kilojoules per mole. In the next step, we'll break the fluorine to fluorine covalent bond so that our molecules of fluorine become uh, free atoms of fluorine. That has a small energy cost associated with it. But adding the electron to the fluorine atom is going to give some of that energy back that we've already had to pay in. Then energy is going to be liberated. A lot of energy will be liberated when these ions come together. So look at that huge energy drop. Now, to calculate the lattice energy, what we have to do is add all the reactions together, right? Hess's law said we can calculate an overall process if we add related processes together. So when I added up all of the heats of formations, whoops, for sodium fluoride, I got in my handy calculator the value of a negative 575 kilojoules per mole. And that's a fairly good approximation of what others calculate it to be. And of course, experimentally, when you determine the heat of formation, you would expect it to be something very similar, given a little bit of wiggle room for experimental error, right? Um, let's see how this has an impact, though, on real life, especially when we're looking at solubility. Sodium and potassium salts tend to be very soluble because they have relatively small lattice energies. But if we looked at, say, um, magnesium or aluminum, those salts tend to be less soluble because it takes more energy to separate the positive and negative ions from these salts. Remember, magnesium forms a positive two charge. Aluminum forms a positive three charge. What do sodium and potassium do? Right, sodium is a plus one and potassium is a plus one. So it makes sense that it um, is easier to separate the charges for salts that, that stick together with plus one than plus two. So for instance, you already know sodium hydroxide is a strong base. It's very soluble in water, it completely dissociates into ions. But we also know magnesium hydroxide is a weak base. It only dissolves a little bit in water to, to the extent of only 0 0.009 grams per liter compared to sodium hydroxide, which is 420 grams per liter. Big difference. And then, of course, aluminum hydroxide is even worse. It's essentially insoluble in water. Um, there's not a measurable amount that we can get to dissolve in a liter of water. So um, 
solubility and lattice energy are closely tied together. When the lattice energy comes from the amount of energy in the charges, we just talked about Coulomb's law. Again, it's like this keeps coming back to us, right? So Coulomb's law says that the uh, energy in this attraction for charged particles has to do with some constant K that depends on the structure of the crystal. The Q's, Q1 and Q2, represent the charges, and R is the distance between the centers of our atoms, the internuclear distance. The lattice energy is going to be greater when you have more highly charged ions because it makes the values of Q to be larger and therefore the energy is going to be bigger because we're multiplying bigger numbers together. So a bigger lattice energy is going to pay for any extra ionization energy it might take to remove three electrons as opposed to only removing one electron. It also would pay for some unfavorable electron affinity if you're trying to uh, move electrons to a place where they wouldn't normally go. So here's a question to consider now at the end of the podcast. Which of the following of these do you think will have the largest lattice energy? Consider all of your choices carefully. Compare all the ions that make these compounds. And when you come to class, I want to know your answer. See you next time.